Hey everybody, welcome back to Recordology. On today's episode, we take it back to the 1980s as we look at what must be the ultimate from a design aesthetic 80s cassette recorder I've ever seen in my life. There's no screen on this, there's not really a display, it's LED lights and funky 80s designs. And it even features the original storeroom floor stickers on the unit, which is really cool. And I'm excited to test it out. I did a basic functionality test at the store. I picked this up for $7 at a thrift store. And we are going to review it, test it, tear it apart, all that fun stuff. You're not going to want to miss this. But before we get started, are you a member of the Vinyl Nation? Do you even know what the Vinyl Nation is? Well, let me extend a cordial invitation to you, yes, you, to join the Recordology Vinyl Nation. It is our sort of paid tier membership level program where you get an extra show that nobody else can see that's not in the nation every single week and other exclusive benefits as well. We must have dozens, if not hundreds of shows that you will be able to access as a member. And I would invite you to check that out. There is a link in the description below. I wanted to mention this early on in the video because I still get comments from people saying they didn't know it existed. So now you know, and you are invited. We'd love to have you over there, but let's get on with the show. So I've been sort of keeping my eye out for another tape deck it was definitely kind of low on the priority list, but if I came across the right one at the right price, I thought it would be interesting to get another dual well tape deck, another dubbing entry level, but interesting tape deck. And I came across this the other day for $6.99 at the thrift store, same thrift store that I got my beautiful Yamaha with the glass ferrite heads for the same price, actually, seven bucks. So you can't beat it. And I was blown away by obviously the 80s aesthetic of this. This is probably right about 1985, as best as I can tell. Uh, once we get the top opened up, we look at the motor date codes and stuff, and maybe even the serial number on the back, we'll probably get a better idea. I also like the fact that it's got these original stickers on it. Now, doing some research, a lot of these, this particular model, this is, by the way, the Sharp RTW800. A lot of this particular model and similar ones still have these stickers people thought it looked cool i guess and just left them on but it's just a you're supposed to peel this off when you got it home but i thought that was kind of interesting but it's cool i mean it, it just looks cool and we'll look at it in more detail so this is a clean unit i did force myself to plug it in at the thrift store i usually have this like urge of excitement and i just run to the register and then come to find out later it's a project that i don't want all basic functions in terms of transport seem to work fine I haven't listened to it yet. We'll listen to it together and we will do a test recording, a direct feed sound test, and we'll open it up as well and see what's inside. To me, Sharp was always one of those B brands, one of those secondary tier brands. Not in the same ballpark to me as like Sony, Panasonic, et cetera, et cetera, but above like Westinghouse and, you know, like low level brands. This is somewhere. I would say this is above RCA, perhaps even a little bit. This is sort of middle ground tier for me. Again, that's my perception. But Sharp is, you know, there's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. I've had a number of Sharp products, both in the past and now. So it is a dual deck unit. These were all consumer grade. The idea was that you could duplicate tapes. That was a huge, huge thing in the 80s and 90s. Was Your friend got an album, you made a dub. I mean, honestly, that's what we were doing with this stuff. You know, we want, somebody got a copy of New Kids on the Block. We, all the kids on the block wanted a copy of New Kids on the Block. And then pretty soon, all kids on the block had a copy of New Kids on the Block. It's just the way it happened. And there was no malicious intent. We weren't selling them. We were just sharing music. So it is, it is what it is. It was what it was. So that's what this was designed for. It is an auto reverse deck, another consumer feature that on higher end decks you won't see because, as we'll see in a minute, the auto reverse mechanism uh, is, is convenient because you never have to flip the tape over and you can do continuous recording. 
The downside is that you lose some of the alignment. The azimuth can be a little bit off. And again, I'll show you why in a minute. So as you can see on the label here, continuous play, that's because of the auto reverse, APSS and metal. It will actually play metal tapes, which you know most decent machines would do. That's not huge, but metal tape was the premium tape to have. I have maybe one or two metal tapes. They're expensive even to this day. I do most of my stuff on type one ferric oxide. It suits my needs, et cetera, et cetera. APSS, automatic position sensor. I'm not 100% sure. Let me know in the comments down below. I know you will. <laughs> but I that either has to do with sensing silence on the tape and allowing you to skip songs, as it were, or it might have something to do with uh, the actual head positioning. I'm not 100% sure. Down here, we've got the transport, con transport controls on deck one. These are not logic controls. These are also not paddle controls, full mechanical switches. Well, they are mechanical, but they're what is called soft touch. So they take very little you know, physical play. There's very little movement in the switches. They don't take much to, to operate. So it's somewhere between a straight mechanical piano or paddle switch and, or a completely mechanical switch and um, logic control, somewhere in between. So that's nice to have. Each deck has its own controls. And if you want to look at a deck from a distance and wonder if it has logic controls or soft touch, if you see individual buttons for each deck, you know instantly that's not uh, logic because logic controls will control either or. Um, right up here, oops, almost rotated it back. Sorry about that. Uh, we've got Dolby system. If you don't see it mentioning Dolby B or C, that means it's only Dolby B, which was pretty common, especially back in this era. Dolby C had yet to really make its way into the consumer mainstream. But again, for me personally, Dolby B is usually all I ever need. I don't like so much Dolby that it, you know, and I've had even Dolby S equipment we've reviewed it on this show. But for me personally, Dolby B is more than enough and it's not uncommon, in fact, I did it today, that I will just play a tape with no Dolby whatsoever. I don't mind a little hiss. There's a uh, direction selector switch for the uh, first deck and a mode switch. So either continuous play or the other mode where it just stops at the end. So we've got some marketing stuff on here, which I think is part of the fun, high-speed dubbing. And that means that when you're recording from one tape to the next, you don't have to listen to it in real time. It, with high-speed dubbing, it basically puts it on fast forward and records it super, super fast. So as your mom's about to, you know, outside honking her horn, picking up you from you spend the night and you didn't remember to copy you know, your friend's uh, copy of New Kids on the Block, MC Hammer, whatever it is, you can throw it in and dub it real quick before you get in big trouble. So there you go. Moving over here. So yeah, this deck two is gonna be the record deck. This one is play only. And let's look over here. The thing that should stand out to begin with is the fact there's no screen, there's no display. It's only LEDs, as we'll see in a little bit here. Only LEDs and lights and a mechanical tape counter. We've got the uh, VU display right there. Kind of a point of contention, you'll notice there's a Dolby symbol right at zero dB. I had heard it said before, and the reason why I mention it is usually it's lower. It's like negative two or negative three dB. I had heard it said that when you see the Dolby symbol on the display like that on the VU meter, that you were supposed to set your peak at the Dolby symbol if you're recording in Dolby versus zero like we would normally do. Some people say, no, that's not true, but I don't understand why that would not be true if some decks have it in a different position. Clearly it's not centered for aesthetic reasons. It's not even centered at all. So it's got to be in my mind that on any particular deck, you are supposed to set, you're supposed to set your peak at the Dolby symbol if you are using Dolby. All right, what else do we got here? We got a, a kind of a repeat of what we had for deck one. This That one was in blue, this one was in red, indicating this is the record deck. We've got the power switch. We have the metal or the uh, tape type for here. You've got normal, you've got metal, uh, and you've got CRO2, which is uh, chrome. And that's a good thing to be able to play basically the main three types of tape that are out there. The Dolby B on and off switch. 
the continuous play switch as well as the dubbing controls for source and speed. If you want to dub high speed or normal speed, and that previous owner has put on a little sticker here saying in for tape dubbing. Actually, it says in for off tape dubbing, but I think what they mean is in for tape dubbing. We've got the uh, volume or the record level controls down there, as well as two microphone inputs and a headphone amplifier as well, at least a headphone jack. Now, I'm not 100% sure how we control the volume once we're plugged in with headphones, because usually there's a separate volume knob by the headphone jack as well. It's probably the record level knobs is, would be my guess, but yeah, there you go. While we're here, let's take a look at the bottom. The construction is pretty typical. The front face plate is plastic. The chassis appears to be metal on the bottom. We've got some shielding here along with a little warning sticker right there, some electrical shielding. Rubberized stickers, this one's moved out of the way. We can reposition that, actually we can do that right now. Wow, that's very sticky, okay. So it got hot and it slid off, you know, years ago probably, but pretty sure they're supposed to be located on these raised areas right there. And that's what it looks like from the bottom. If we rotate over to the side, the case, metal case with recessed screws there. And again, that metal, textured metal surface on the sides. Let's go ahead and look at the back. You know, I always say that the Westlife is the ultimate in dating a product with a serial number. My friend, good luck with this one. This is serial number TSPC1742AFZZ. <laughs> I, if you could figure it out off that, I will be even more impressed than I usually am. Uh, so yeah, there's the model number RTW800 uh, and then in parentheses BK indicating this is the black variant. I'm not 100% sure what other variants were available. All the ones I've seen of these are all black. Perhaps there was a gray one. I'm sure there wasn't a white one. Made in Korea. And let's see, what else can I think about? Oh yeah, probably about 140 $130 new. I tried to find a catalog picture of this. I looked at the 1985 and 1986 Sears Wish books and stuff, and I didn't really come across anything. If you guys find that, shoot me an email. I'd like to see it. Over here, we've got RCA left and right input and output, and that's about it. There's a little twisty tie here, a little loop for you can put the twisty tie to hold the power cord bundled up there if you so choose. Just noticing this now, a little warning sign there. It looks like a screws for the case have been removed and are missing on the back. So we won't be the first people inside this machine. But let's go ahead and peek inside anyway and see what, see what we can see. We should be able to date it with the motor date codes and see what other components. I have heard from a friend of mine that this probably has Matsushita motors. And in terms of the tape mechanism, I'm very curious. Probably won't be able to get a definitive answer on this but I'm not sure if Sharp was making their own. Tanishin didn't really get on the scene until 1986, so I think this might predate that by about a year. But anyway, let's open up the case and see what's inside. Okay, so three of the four screws that I took out matched. <laughs> the other one, not so much. Somebody's definitely been under the hood here, but hopefully that means they were taking care of it, replacing belts, all that good stuff. Like I said, everything, all the basic functions do work. I did verify that. And here is what we're dealing with. So let's get a little bit of a closer look and we will peruse around the inside of this thing. Give it a look. Right, let's start back in this corner. Here is our power supply. Kind of surprised there's not more shielding around it. Sometimes there'll be an entire metal casing. I mean, I think this, it's just like, that is metal, but it's wrapped in this plastic with this like red or brown kind of goo long since dried up adhesive, I think. Isn't that interesting? Even this wrap around um, this part here looks like it was put on wet. Very interesting. It's interesting how every one of these you open up, it'll be done differently. There does look to be uh, this sort of shield around that capacitor there, big old capacitor. Circuit board is brown. This is right about the time when circuit boards kind of switched from being brown to green. Not 100% sure the significance of that, but yeah. I actually worked a long time ago for a company that did PCBs, and it's amazing what they can just print, obviously PCB printed circuit board these days. 
and what can be miniaturized and uh, versus, you know, a circuit board, even of this era, but certainly of like the 70s. There's the back of the RCA jacks. Everything seems to be cabled and bundled in a clean and concise manner. I'm going to spin this around. So the first thing I notice is that the belts all seem to be in good condition. The one asterisk to this thing uh, I do have at this point, and when I say that, I mean not a yellow flag, but point of note, something to pay attention to uh, for myself as I you know, evaluate next steps on this deck, are when I was testing out the basic functions at the store, I did notice that the take-up spool in play mode took a second to get going. And that can be a couple different things. It could even be as simple as, you know, drain capacitors taking a couple seconds to charge. It could be, you know, a loose belt, dry rubber, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, poor uh, adhesive, not adhesive, lubrication, opposite of that. And I'm not 100% sure, but I'm just going to kind of give it time to demonstrate how it's going to work or not. Interesting this bold marking right there on the board, F2178AF, AF. <laughs> Just an interesting, interesting, interesting setup. So I like the fact that the uh, individual decks, the individual mechanisms don't share any components. Sometimes on cheap dual well cassette decks, they'll actually be like one motor controlling both decks. And through a crazy series of relays and switches and gears and et cetera, et cetera, they can avoid having to uh, use a secondary motor, which is craziness, absolutely craziness. Sometimes on higher end decks, you'll even get two motors per deck. Like I think the, pa the Pioneer I had had that, but this one has one motor per deck, which is good. Looking at the uh, sticker on there, I still can't discern a date. I mean, honestly, 50-7420A has got to be the make or the model number because they have the same number. They wouldn't have the same number if it was a date code necessarily. So again, help me to date this. I'm guessing 85, possibly 86, but that's my assessment right out of the gate. And let's look down into the deck itself or into the transport. We've got some tubular and square belts. We've got uh, flat belts as well. I wonder if that's a date code on, stamped on top there. 0912-1666. No, that's not a date code either. Interesting. And then here's looking down in the other deck as well. I don't see any issues. Everything looks fine. Everything looks to be in good working order. I guess the ne you'll see how this kind of this piece sort of flexes. It's, it's not completely rigid without the top case on. That actually helps with some of the rigidity needed for the uh, cabinet itself. It forms part of the support structure. So without it, you got to be kind of careful because this can flex off. If you need to work on these decks this piece, this entire faceplate can come off and, and, the, and the transports are connected to them. Again, fairly typical there. If we look inside the actual tape mechanism itself, I wanted to show you a couple of things. So first of all, the heads are smooth. I did the fingernail test where you gently glide your fingernail over the top and there's no ridges, there's no cuts, indicating the head isn't worn down beyond use which is good. We've got two cap stands, two pinch rollers because it's an auto reverse deck and it needs to be able, you know, to play in both directions. So how do they do that? Well, they use a two track head. They could use a four track head and then just activate alternate tracks depending on which direction it's facing. But what they often do, and this is no exception, you can tell by the circular piece that the head is connected to, they will rotate the entire head assembly in 180 degrees. That'll basically put that stereo head in contact with the other two tracks. And because it rotates, there's a solenoid that operates that switch. Because it does that, it means that you don't get uh, precision when it's in place. It's pretty dang close. It'll probably be fine for most users, but a more precise higher end deck, 
the, the head would be stationary, would not rotate. And therefore, many higher end tape decks are not auto reverse, which is just the way it is. Let's look at the other deck here. Similar, but not exactly the same. The biggest difference is it's got a smaller head. You'll notice it's sharing space with that little black thing to the left. That would be the actual erase head. That will be an electromagnet. So the tape is always in contact with the erase head, but the erase head is not active until you select it with the appropriate switch. This is the higher end type of erase head. However, it is a, a tiny one and it's sharing space with a smaller head. This has what looks to be a K62 head, whereas the other deck has a completely different head. That's an F10, I wanna say. Not 100% sure. Again, I'm not sure if that's a sharp product or not, but look at the head size difference. Will that result in lower quality sound from this deck versus this deck? If so, I would say it would be minimal, but I wanted to show you the difference anyway. Okay, so I have dimmed the lights so we can see the display lights on this a little better. It is plugged in now. So let's go ahead and power it up and see what happens. We're gonna do a basic test with just a speaker ambiently first, test basic functionality. Then we're gonna do a uh, line in recording test and a direct feed playback test. So I wanna record on this deck and play back that tape on this deck for you to hear how it performs. I'm gonna be using for the, uh, just the ambient basic taste, te taste test, tape test, this Fisher Price cassette. This thing is very, very cool. I've selected a regular type one ferric oxide tape, no Dolby, here we go. Wow, it sounds, it sounds real rough. Now I am using the same speaker that I recently used on another test and somebody suggested that maybe I've got issues with this speaker. So to rule that out, we're going to eliminate this speaker and we'll use something else. Okay, I've got another speaker. I've got this sound bar here. It still sounds super muffled, super muffled. So let's try a different tape. Okay, I'm gonna try this uh, Giants of the Big Band era. These are mostly uh, bootlegs or angle mics. Let's see if this sounds any better. Sounds better, it's clear. It's better. Flip on the back side here. Try winding it a little bit. Yeah, it's um, yeah, doesn't sound so good. It's definitely a lot like my Yamaha. But there's so many factors. I want to rule out of bad speakers, bad cables, bad tapes. You know what I mean? And I'm gonna rewind on the other side here and give it a test. I've got this other tape we can try as well. And see what this. Is. Okay, it's very loud, but it sounds sharp. I mean, it sounds like, you know what I mean? Like our issue, I think, was a very poor quality tape. I think that this is just really bad. So to confirm that, I'm going to swap out one more tape. We'll try this uh, Stars for Victory Musical Stage Door Cantina tape. Give this a shot. Yeah, I think that's the recording. I think it's okay, I think the deck is okay. So I'm gonna turn the volume down on the speaker so we don't blow ourselves away again. And we'll continue with this one because I think that this gave us a pretty good subject matter to test from. Now when we do the direct, when we do the uh, recording and the direct feed playback, um, I'm, I've picked some new digital music, it's 100% clean, it's some Kevin McLeod music and we're gonna record that straight from a smartphone through a little converter to convert it analog. I've got this little, this guy right here. If you've got an Apple iPhone, you're probably familiar with these. It takes the uh, lightning port and converts it into a regular analog jack. So we can use this 
both ways. I mean, it works. I've, I'm using one of these right now, actually, uh, with a microphone connected to my iPhone 12. And then I've got another iPhone SE Gen 2 that we'll use uh, as a playback source, record that into this deck and then play it back from this deck direct feed. So a little technical behind the scenes there, what's going on. So yeah, let's see, make sure we got our volume set, right? Um, play. Okay, I've got the volume set. Let's go over here and test out this deck as well. This is the one that was slow to start playing. See, it did it again. It works, it just takes a second. And it's not a capacitor. It wouldn't be a capacitor twice, you know what I mean, in a row. Let's go ahead and flip direction here once it starts playing. And we'll test that out with this little switch here. You can just flip it in real time to the other side of the tape. There's really not much to see in terms of lights. I thought there would be more down in this region. But... And of course, my hedge trimmer guy decides to show up right now too, which is beautiful. Okay, so that should be enough. Let's go ahead and play our tape. And then I'm gonna flip this tape direction switch. So that works. Interesting, so it's not a mechanical switch, it's actually an electric switch. It goes down every time. That's interesting. Very cool, very, very cool. And by the way, this is interesting. You'll notice that all of these buttons down here, all these switches are on a horizontal plane. And I don't know if you noticed when we had the case off, but that lines up with where the circuit board is mounted. So these are uh, surface mount switches that go straight onto the circuit board itself. By the way, if you do the eject test, that's a pretty quick eject, but it's not like janky quick. It's just, it is damped a little bit. You can see it glides, but it's not like one of those slow ones. It's like, you know what I mean? <laughs> and no, I wasn't flipping you off. All right, here we go. Play on this deck. So that's the same effect you would get if it was on auto reverse mode. When it got to the end of the tape, it would do the same thing, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, well, we've tasted, tested. Gosh, I keep saying tasted, and I already ate. That's what's crazy about that. I'm not even hungry. But we've tested the major functionality. So what we're going to do now is make a Dolby B recording and then play it back with a direct feed. Testing out another uh, tape I made. Not on this machine. It was an older test tape. I mean, to the ear, it sounds fine. The sound quality isn't like blowing my mind, but at the same time, I'm not like concerned. You know what I mean? I'm not worried. So, okay, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna switch this over from output to input. And I'm gonna disconnect it from my speaker off camera here. And I'm gonna use, like I said, that iPhone. I'm going to connect this adapter into the iPhone. So like I said before, we're gonna use some Kevin McLeod music. I've got my headphones maxed out at 100. And let's start by level setting. I'm gonna hit play on the source. We're not gonna hear anything off the bat. And if I go to record, oh, it's actually just gonna start recording. So it's got one touch controls. That's okay. Um, and then we can use this to set the levels. So I'm going to, first I am gonna do Dolby, by the way. And as you can see, it's peaking just into zero. Back off the right channel a little bit. That's pretty close. Looks like, I always want the level as hot as I can without it distorting. That's sort of the gold standard. So I'm gonna let this record and then I'm going to do a direct feed playback and we'll listen for ourselves and how good this deck sounds both on record and playback okay and without any further delay let's go ahead and listen to our recorded tape right here on this sharp rtw 800 from about 1985 
All right, my friends, and that is going to do it for today. Thank you so much for being there. Happy record hunting, and we'll see you next time.